I hope you can see it. Yes. So, uh, okay, thank you. So today I'm going to discuss about the various causes uh, for why a small river, which is located outside, which is located just outside Calcutta, and why it is vanishing over the time. So this is the location of the or introduction to the river. And the river is located in a district called Nadia in West Bengal, which is a state of India. And as you can see in the right, the river originates from another river, which is called Jolongi. And then it passes through this town called Krishnanagar, which is a very old agricultural town. And then it moves towards southeast and then towards south and then towards east. And then it meets another river, uh, which is called Churni at Yaspur. So this is the short introduction of uh, Anjana. And these two maps shows where Anjana River stands in the overall hydrological map of West Bengal, as well as the river, as well as the Nadia district, where you can clearly see that the Anjana is a connecting river, as well as tributary river for Jalangi and Churni. So the river has a long history. And as I told that uh, Anjana was the mouth of the Anjana has Krishnagar, which is an agricultural town. And the town dates back to almost 1600. Historical records show that the town existed uh, since then. And this is, this is what Anjana is in our public imagination still today, that it is a very rural, laid back, green, lush green, uh, very idle kind of environment. And, uh, and the environment was so enticing that even Rabindranath Tagore wrote a poem on the river, which is still being taught at the primary school in West Bengal. So Anjana River was always been a part of the fluid ecosystem of the Delta, which is characterized by two things. One is the changing flow of the rivers and subsequently the changing uh, tenure of land tenure of the area. And you can see that in this uh, script from uh, the statistical accounts of Nadia, Captain Colbrook in his memoir on Ganges in 19, 1797 says that the, the Jalangi used to be formerly navigable during the whole or greater part of the year. It says that it is not navigable throughout the year, which means that it either changes its course or the river or the water flow changes very rapidly and the siltation happens very rapidly. That is why it is not uh, dependable for practicable for boats proceeding to Calcutta. So it is not a constant flow of water there. And these are the rivers around Anjana. But since I told that Anjana is dependent on Jalangi and the water flow from Jalangi actually impacts the water flow of Anjana. So Anjana has always been a part of this fluid ecosystem. And that also impacted the land tenure, existing land tenure since the Mughal times or since the 1500s in this area. And the prevalent land tenure system along with various others is called the Utbandi, which means that you have to stay or acquire and then stay in one tract of land for at least subsequently 12 years. Only then the ownership will be transferred to your land, which says that, that 12 years is a long time for anything to be happen in that area because of the changing water flow, the siltation, and the changing course of the river. That is why a temporary land tenure system has been uh, practiced in these areas. And the name of that is Utpandi. So this, uh, sorry. So this also tells us about the human land water nexus in the Delta 
as we can see that in the same statistical institute uh, statistical account of nadia there is a distinct section which is devoted to the boating and fishing castes which tells that there are a certain number of people who are and quite large number this is in 19 Uh, this is in almost in 1780s this this number exists that 54000 people are actually dependent directly on the uh, river and as well as the agricultural caste which are also people who are dependent on the river and the large tract of marshes and water bodies which surrounds this area so overall this tells a picture of human land water nexus in the delta region of ganga brahmaputra delta as well as the anjana river so our research suggests that the in the past anjana river has uh, several things including a presence of circular economy which of course was based around the river and the rivers used to produce fish and then it had this allied activities of boat making and net making and then the trading and the textile and the subsequent uh, social functions including various festivals which extend or they extended also to the agricultural areas so this was anjana's past until i would say uh, 1750 after the 1750 what happened was by that time the britishers had quite con- britishers had quite control on the bengal lands they were given the jagir or the uh, lease of bengal and there were several thing happened number one there was the loss of textile industry which was thriving in and around the uh, anjana river there was this fall of rise and fall of indigo economy uh, so people so the britishers what they did is they actually uh, poached lands which are meant for rice cultivation and forced people to produce indigo there and as a result the people could not uh, get their food grains for sustenance and then it subsequently led to induced famines famines are also responsible famines also happened due to the inappropriate governance which started as the permanent settlement in that region where the british go- government then british government actually uh, did not understood the fluid <coughs> geography of that region and they insisted on uh, fixed income or fixed revenue each year from that uh, area which was not possible due to the, the and subsequently the problem subsequently the inappropriate uh, land tenure system and uh, the infrequent uh, cultivation so after, in the 1905 the railway bridge was uh, uh, in the introduced in the area and this had two fold implication in that area one is that people started to flee from this famine from the la- before before a decade and people started to flee from this area to the neighboring areas where jute mills of- offered better employment opportunities and secondly physically what happened that the railway bridge obstructed the flow of the water which you can still see this uh, picture was taken last year uh, because of the bridge which was designed very poorly it has managed to completely stop the flow of the river the demise of anjana in the post independence period in the from 1948 to 1990 it started with the in 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 the refugees who came to nadia in within uh, three for three years almost 0.4 million refugees came to india and then uh, to sustain these people to have economic uh, activities for these people the then west bengal government started to 
introduce fisheries in that area. And in the name of the fishery, what happened was the area, the river was actually divided and converted into several large ponds. And they exist still now. This is one of such ponds, which is known as Ghoshpur, which is located in the heart of the city and it still exists there. And then again in 1971 to 81, almost 4 million refugees from Bangladesh came to Nadia and they contributed and altered to the change of land use permanently in that area. Finally, the fourth part of the demise happened due between 1991 to 2020. And during this time, the mouth of the river was gagged by some people, including one brick kill uh, owner who completely uh, covered the mouth of the river for his own convenience. And at the same time, in the rural area, encroachments uh, came up. And uh, in the urban area, garbage dumping has become very, very prevalent. And here also, there are two things happening. On one hand, uh, these people, they are encroaching this uh, river. And at the same time, they are producing a narrative that the river was never there. It was originally a man-made canal. And hence, uh, they have kind of a right to uh, destroy that. So this graph actually shows or summarizes the total demise of the uh, Anjana River. And it also summarizes the chronology of human actions on Anjana River, which starts with a king who puts up an uh, Arden Dam on the mouth of the river to protect himself from the uh, foreign invaders. And then subsequently, British indigo planters create uh, further obstructions to, in fear of mutiny. And then local landlords put urban dams across rivers to start commercial fishery. And it has, I should say that it has gone to a full circle when again the brick kiln owner has uh, started. Uh, completely blocking off the mouth of the river. And today it has converted into a 31 inch drain. So our current observation, when I started this uh, research, my current observation was that the river was monitored by people. There is little change happened in the last 20 years and people have social association with the river and there is no development pressure on the river and people support the river. So the question remains that why Anjana River is environmentally degrading still now? To look into the matter, I took two lenses. One is the remembered past and one is the witness present. So I intended to see that what people imagine or what people learned from their stories from their forefathers. I treated that as a remembered past and what they are doing or what they actually witnessed in the last 20 years or some written documents about the river. I treated that as a witness present. So within these two uh, lenses, I tried to find that how or to what extent the five prerequisite conditions of effective common governance, which are namely easily monitored resources, change in resources, social capital, presence of outsiders, and user support are satisfied for environmental governance of Anjana River. And the time period taken is from 2000 to 2020. These research questions or research framework has been developed from Eleanor Ostrom and Dietz's theory on effective common governance, which they published in a paper in 2003. So this is the analysis part of that uh, research, where it has, where you can see that the result have shown that the user support and the monitoring of fish and land, as well as the change in flow of water 
have a huge impact on the public participation, the available infrastructure, the adaptation, and the information uh, about the river or the environmental information about the river. So my research concluded in this way that Ostrom says that monitoring of resources actually enhance the environmental governance. Whereas I found that the biophysical condition of the river is very varied and it is inherently heterogeneous. Therefore, monitoring of resource is never easy for the people. Secondly, the moderate changes in resources enhances the environmental governance. But what I found is that the change can happen outside the timeline for the research taken. Therefore, it can affect the problem even before we conceive the problem. Thirdly, there is high social network among the stakeholders enhances the environmental governance. But we heard, I saw that the past and present levels of association, as well as the socioeconomic background of the participants, creates a heterogeneous relationship with the resource. Then high user support among the stakeholder enhances the environmental governance. And here I saw that the environmental, the user support can vary in terms of physical, economical, knowledge and information wise. Therefore, it is not a uniform uh, support altogether. And finally, what I found that in today's world, every natural resource has come under some form of formal governance that is local government or state government or national government. Therefore, outsiders are always there and their inaction is also can be treated as an action for ourselves or for our cause. So this is the finding on the human land water nexus uh, in that area. And my uh, and I found that it is a mixed bag thing. It is, there is no one way of looking at it. So what I found the, at the same time, the past association with the resource and the religious rules and the deep structure which lies in the society are enhancing the environmental governance in that region. However, extreme path dependence created by the over dependence on the resource, past association with other groups, level of trust, and quality and quantity of horizontal and vertical governance and integration of governance effectively have created hindrances in the environmental governance of the river. At the same time, what I found that the there is a problem of moribund economy, lack of innovation, actor institution nexus, which is very prevalent in the area. And there is marginal, marginalization, polarization, migration, and changing occupational dynamics. All these have contributed to the decreasing environmental governance. However, at the same time, new education policies, which includes the environmental education, and the support from local government and especially judiciary and the understanding of the importance of river and involvement of academia over time have created a good environmental governance in the, in the decent years. The example can be seen here, which shows that the yellow parts are the existing governance mechanisms in the area. And it ranges from state to district to block level to revenue level to the habitation level, which is the various tiers of the government. And there are several departments such as fisheries, land revenue, irrigation, water resource, soil and river commission. All they are responsible at various levels uh, for the health of the river, still the lack of vertical and horizontal governance, and not only Anjana, it is true for the other rivers in the area also. So what is happening is that 
now there are ngos as well as some uh, some uh, river commission people they are now collaborating and they are now trying to form river council which is and uh, which will act as a peer group or a pressure pressure group at four levels uh, namely the habitation the revenue village level the block level and the district level and the state level so these uh, river councils will try to put pressure on the concerns about the river to the respective authorities and they will also try to document the concerns and they will also try to follow up the concerns of the uh, actions taken so these river councils what i found have started very recently uh, in the month of uh, october 2019 but then in 2020 the lockdowns uh, then 2020 during the lockdown they could not work much but they are still trying to do that and currently there are three areas where they are working one is very near to anjana river the second is a uh, little far and one in bangladesh they are trying to implement these uh, river councils there uh, so through these river councils they are trying to in impart the constitutional rights of people people uh, regarding river health as well as the rejuvenation of the river so so far this is my research have which i have done thank you thank you very much uh, shonko um